Hello, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about something which has been bugging me for a while and which I've been thinking about and which I think is actually more of a general issue than an issue about emerging diseases themselves, although that's how I'm going to couch the idea. Um, this pie chart shows the votes in the UK general election, average proportional vote since 1929 for the two leading parties and then all the rest. It doesn't matter who the two leading parties are, the point that this pie chart makes is that people really like simple things. People like binary choices, they like to choose from binary choices, and they like to make binary choices and define the world in a simple way. There are a myriad of different parties, but when it comes down to it, this is what we tend to do. It's not just a UK phenomenon, look at the US and look at many countries in Europe. Now, psychologists have come up with some ideas for why this may be so. And what they suggest is that humans, to understand the world, have to mentally construct it. And so as you were all growing up, you were constructing the world for yourself, and you were constructing it in a series of polar opposites. Black, white, good, bad, up, down, large, small. And yes, there's a continuum between those things, but because people also like simple choices, we think about the ends. And that's interesting, and it explains a lot about what humans do, but I think it's also potentially fundamentally problematic. From a biolo biologist's perspective, which is what I am, the psychology makes a lot of sense to me, but I wonder also whether it isn't something that's a little bit more hardwired in our biology itself. If we think about humans, we start off being split into this binary system of female and male. And I apologize for the gender stereotyping. It's very hard to get a picture which is simple about men and women, which doesn't somehow gender stereotype. Of course, if we say that that biology is driving also how our mind works, to think about the world in a binary way because we're a binary species, that suggests that if we weren't a binary species, we might approach the world in a different way. And in actual fact, biologically, it's not this simple at all. So one out of every 1,500, 2,000 children that are born are born intersex. They're not born as clearly defined males or clearly defined females. We actually define that for them through drugs or through surgery relatively quickly after they're born and then over a period of time until they mature. So you could argue maybe that actually this binary sexual construction can't just be biologically hardwired, it's socially hardwired too. Anyway, the point is we like simple things and we like binary things. And surprisingly, scientists are also human, um, going against popular culture. And consequently, when we look at things, we also tend to look for simple explanations. And one of my favorite examples of that is this. So here we've got two cuddly animals, um, a lynx, a Canadian lynx, and a Canadian snowshoe hare. And one of the really exciting things about snowshoe hares, snowshoe hares for biologists is that they show these really weird 10-year population boom and bust cycles. So that red line there shows the population of snowshoe hares in Canada, over a and each of those boom and bust cycles is about 10 years long. Why? This is really strange. And so our explanation for this, or or our first explanation for this, is that it must be being driven by something, and it could be being driven by lots of things, yeah? It could be being driven by predation, by a lack of food, by changes in the weather, but the nice, simple explanation is that it's being driven by these evil, horrible lynx, which are chasing down the cute, fluffy snowshoe hares, and we can see in the blue the lynx population cycle, and it peaks just after the snowshoe hares and goes down, and then it starts climbing after the snowshoe hare population goes up. And so here we have what is known as a simple t binary system. It's a predator-prey cycle. Of course, it's not this simple. I may come back to this later. But it's an example of a simple biological explanation for, which, for something which is probably a lot more complicated. The same kind of binary approach has been taken across whole fields of biology. Um, not all of them. There are some which, just by their definition, can't be simple. But the vast majority of biology does tend to take a simple approach, because, again, we're humans and that's how we divide the world up. And I work in an area which is known as host parasite biology. I'm really interested in how parasites, as represented here by a little worm, infect their hosts, how they damage their hosts, and also why some parasites cause a lot of damage and some parasites cause very little damage. 
Why is all that variety there? What are they doing? And how are they impacting their host populations? And taking that simple binary approach has been very successful in understanding host parasite biology. We know a lot about why some parasites cause a lot of damage and why others don't. We can even make models and predict it and then test it and see that our models are mm, kind of right and then go back and tweak them again. But it's all based around this very simple binary approach. And that, I think, starts to fall down when we begin to think about one of the major problems faced by human society today, and that problem is the problem of emergent disease. <coughs> this person hopefully doesn't have one, um, <laughs> but it's a nice example of two of the emergent diseases that really have gained a lot of public attention, which are avian flu and swine flu. And the idea of an emergent disease is that you have a disease-causing organism, a virus, a bacteria, some other kind of parasite in one species, say a pig, and it hops across into another species, say a human, and then it explodes and it has an epidemic and lots of people die and that's really bad. These emergent diseases are not just limited to humans, as I'll come to later, but they are where we start to think about them. And again, we tend to approach these in a binary way, even though it's not a binary system. So, of course, the current very sad and um, upsetting example is that of Ebola virus in a small part of West Africa. And so Ebola virus, which you can see here, normally is cycling around in some kind of host organism. We think it's a bat, possibly a fruit bat. We're not absolutely sure yet. We haven't nailed it down but we think it's cycling around there in some kind of binary system type approach. And then at some point, perhaps because people um, play where there are bat droppings or because they eat bats, it jumps across into humans. And then again, we can think of it as this binary system. And that works as long as that transmission from one species to another happens once or happens very infrequently. And we can treat those two as separate things. But the reality is that for the probably the majority of parasites which move around between different host species, those movements between host species happen much more quickly and much more frequently. And in fact, we've got good evidence to suggest that about 50% of parasite species have multiple hosts that they cycle around all the time. And so the question then becomes, how can we understand those systems, particularly when those systems are causing huge problems to us? And I come at this from the perspective of bees. So this is a, a wonderful piece of graffiti that you can find if you take the um, overground south circular route through London. Highly recommend it just for this view. Um, and what you can see here is a couple of different bee species. So there's a bumblebee on the right-hand side with that Doom of the Fruit logo above it. Um, you've, got a couple of, you've got a honeybee on this side here. And you can see a little hashtag there for all the tweeters in the audience, hashtag save the bees. Bees are important. They're important to us for two reasons. Firstly, they pollinate, they fertilize wildflowers. So they take pollen from one flower to another, and that allows that flower to set seed. Without the bees, we lose a large chunk of our wildflowers. That would be really sad. We would lose a lot of biodiversity. Humans aren't very good at, at doing things about things which are sad, I think. <laughs> they tend to go, oh, isn't that really sad? Right, let's go and do something else. <laughs> so we can make it more real. I can say to you that three out of four of every mouthfuls of food that you consume relies on bees and other insects to pollinate it. And therefore, if we lost them, we lose a huge chunk of our food resources. I was chatting with David a little earlier. It's not true that if all the bees disappeared, we'd starve within three years, as Einstein supposedly suggested. But what is true is that we would lose a lot of our food. A nice example I like, because I like tomatoes, is that without bumblebees, none of the tomatoes you buy in supermarkets would exist. And if we went back to the old way of producing tomatoes, which is to walk around with little vibrators in your hand and vibrate every single flower, they'd be a heck of a lot more expensive, and we wouldn't have found them in our sandwiches today. So bees are important, but bees are also in trouble. So in North America and Europe, honeybees are in huge decline and have been for a number of years. Pretty much everywhere we look in the world, wild bees are in, are in trouble. They're declining in populations and in range, and that obviously means that we potentially have an issue there. And one of the reasons that this relates to emergent disease is because one of the things that's driving those declines is disease. 
Now, I've been looking at diseases in, in bumblebees for about 16 years now, um, and one of the things that's really nice about them is they do provide a way to look at these dynamics of emergent diseases. So, as you can see from this photo, flowers need bees, bees need flowers for food, but flowers are also parasite-ridden disease areas for the bees. This is where diseases are passing around, and that means if a bee from, say, a honeybee comes and lands on this flower, after a bumblebee or vice versa, they could potentially be swapping diseases. And so we can look and see what's happening there to ask whether this is really the complex picture I'm telling you that it is. And one way to do this is to look at natural, not emergent diseases, but just natural diseases that are present in the bees. This is a trypanosome gut parasite. It lives inside the gut of bumblebees. It has a very simple life cycle. It doesn't make them feel brilliant. And if a bumblebee queen comes out of hibernation and she's already infected by this, her reproductive output, the number of new queens and males that she produces, is reduced by nearly 50%. So that's quite a dramatic effect. That would be like if you had a disease that made you have one child instead of two. I talked about the lynx and snowshoe hares earlier on, and I was a bit rude about the lynx. Actually, they're very beautiful, charismatic, stunning animals as are the snowshoe hares, but they live in cold places, and I don't really like the cold. And one of the reasons I work with bumblebees is because it means you can sit outside in the sun in a flowery meadow watching them. <laughs> and so that's what we did to try and understand what's going on with this parasite. And what we found is that it is a real complex system. This is a little bit complicated, but actually the message isn't. So here we've got a bunch of different bumblebee species, and if you take one thing away from, from hearing me today, I hope you'll take away the fact that there are more than one bumblebee species, um, <laughs> even in the UK with our deep corporate fauna. And the arrows between them show potential transmission between them. The thickness of the arrow shows how likely that transmission is. So a big thick arrow like up on the top here suggests that transmission from that nice red-tailed bumblebee to that rather brown, dowdy-looking bumblebee is very likely, but the flip side isn't true. It's highly unlikely for that red-tailed bumblebee to pick something up from the brown bumblebee. And what this means is if we want to understand the dynamics of this system and how it works and who's being affected most and where we might want to intervene if we wanted to break it down, we've got to understand these complex dynamics. And those simple binary systems that I talked about at the beginning don't help us do that. But if we really want to think about disease and declines in bees, we have to open our focus a little bit and move out from bumblebees. I think this is a stunningly beautiful photograph. I'm prepared to accept that people may disagree with me on that. What we have here is a parasitic blood-sucking mite <laughs> sitting on the head of a developing honeybee. This mite is beautifully named, it's Varroa destructor, and what it does is it gets into the little beautiful hexagonal cases that the bee, honeybees build, and it sucks blood out of larvae and pupae. And that's kind of bad, um, but actually that's not the reason that this mite is behind probably the vast declines in honeybees across North America and Europe. The reason is, is because it actually acts as a syringe for viruses to be transmitted. And this is one of those viruses, or at least the effects of it. This is a honeybee. Anyone see what's different about this bee? Yeah, it's got no wings. Can't fly. It's rubbish. It's useless. Can't do its job. It can't fly from flower to flower gathering food. And that's because it has the very well-named, so biologists are good at naming things, deformed wing virus. It has <laughs> deformed wings. It does what it says on the tin. This is a real problem. These viruses are probably what's behind the problems in honeybees, but we know that bumblebees are also in decline. Is it possible that actually the, the picture is not this simple? And so again, taking advantage of nice sunny days, going outside, catching bees, doing a little bit of jiggery-pokery in the lab to actually see whether they're infected or not, we went out to look. And this is a, a heat map. It shows where you're most likely to find honeybees that have deformed wing virus in the UK in 2012. It's probably a little bit different this year. If you then look to see where it is in bumblebees, what we find is that not only is it present, but the pattern of presence mirrors what we see in honeybees. And what this means is that this virus is circulating not just within honeybees, 
but among honeybees and bumblebees, probably going back and forth in between them, mediated by the flowers that they share for foraging, meaning that to understand and control this virus, which is currently being controlled on the basis that it's only in honeybees, means we need to understand this complex system. We need to understand where transmission is happening. We need to understand which direction is transmission going in. And again, we can't take a simple binary approach to that, as we have done in modeling diseases, and really in modeling um, the vast majority of biological systems. So there's a very specific message there, I think, about bees, hence the beautiful hexagonal hive background. They never look this good, by the way. <laughs> Almost, but not quite. But they're a nicer color. I think the broader point here is that the world is a complex place. And that sounds very facile. And I'm sure everybody in the audience here has thought about complexity and simplicity before. The problem is, is that most of the time, when humans make decisions, whether it's about how to understand diseases and emergent diseases, or whether it's how to vote in a general election or anything in between, we're naturally drawn to these simple decisions and these binary choices, because that's how we've created the world in our head. And I think what we need to ask ourselves, and what we need to ask more generally, is how can we change how people grow up to construct the world so that they can exist and think in a world which is much more complex than we want it to be. Because if we don't deal with that complexity, we get the answers wrong. Thanks very much.